All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode. That's right, of the London is Blue podcast. Hopefully your favorite Chelsea podcast coming at you with another emergency podcast because Chelsea can't stop, won't stop doing deals, making things happen this summer. We're going to get into all the crazy stuff that happened today with Lavia saying yes and getting the here we go from Fabrizio Romano, talking a little bit about some crazy shenanigans going on with the Michael Olise deal, and then get into a whole host of just bits and bobs of news, Nicholas, on the work remaining still for Chelsea. How are you feeling, though? I think the people are concerned for you. They want to make sure that you're feeling okay, that the positive vibes are returning, that we're getting you connected to a little bit of that, uh, I don't know, the happy machine. I The transfer window has annoyed the fuck out of me, but if you listen to the Liverpool match review, I think I was overwhelmingly positive in that match review because I thoroughly enjoyed the way that we played. So I, I, like many people, are looking forward to the end of this window. And, Dan, so are our weeknights. Our weeknights are looking forward to the end of this transfer window as well. Um, you know, you tried to go to a movie on Sunday. Uh, that was a stupid decision, as you uh, will, will have learned very quickly, that yeah. you can't just go to a movie these oh, days no. without a transfer happening. One does not simply go to the movies without there being some sort of news. And one does not simply try and get through a work day anymore without there being four or five different articles about how Chelsea are ruining football. So it kind of does feel like we're back in a way, you know? It feels yeah. like order's been restored a little bit, that the articles are back. When everybody is throwing the slings and arrows at you for taking advantage of the loopholes, for selling record profit of players and then spending underneath that amount, boy, oh boy, it really ruffles some feathers. But we're going to get into a lot of that as we get into this episode because there is some things that we need to discuss. But before we talk about Lavia first, we just want to say thank you to everybody who supports the podcast. Great way to do that is through patreon.com forward slash Linda Boo Pod. You can join our amazing Discord community. But if you want to support us for free, you can do that too. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Great way to help people find the show and let them know it's of a wonderful quality. And then also head over to YouTube. We're on our way to 28,000. We'd love to hit 30,000 before the end of the month. And you can do that for free as well. Just hit subscribe, get notified when a new one comes out. It's really great. And you get to see the visceral reactions that we have sometimes to the terrible jokes that we mention to one another. Yeah, you, was that a direct shot across the bow to me, Dan? No, no, no. That was just a mention. That was just a mention. But look, we yeah. just want to say thank you yeah. again for everybody who does those wonderful things, help support the podcast. But we got the here we go, Romeo Lavia today from Southampton to Chelsea. Fabrizio Romano, David Orenstein, and many others talking about how Chelsea have reached the agreement with Southampton. It was a fee of 53 million pounds plus 5 million in add-ons. They're getting a medical done. They're finalizing the terms. They're getting the deal complete. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get the announcement out on Wednesday morning. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get out on Thursday morning, Nick. But the expectation from Fabricio and Ornstein is that at some point this week, Romeo Levia will be announced as a Chelsea player, which will be another addition to the midfield rebuild seven years in the making. I mean, we did it, right? We, 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 we did it, Joe. the midfield. We did it. <laughs> we, did, we did it. I mean, it's, I, you now have too many midfielders. It's crazy. It's a, it's an intense amount of midfielders. Uh, this is also the day where uh, Cesare Cassade moved to Leicester City on loan. Um, yep. Right? You have Andre Santos. You have Connor Gallagher. You have Leslie Ukuchukwu. Um, and I apologize if I butchered that, but I think that was right. Um, you know, let's hope it's right anyway. Uh, so yeah, it's it's, a, it's been a wild time. If you think about the aging midfield uh, from whence we came last year. You think about the different types of personalities that we used to have in that midfield, the Champions League winning midfield from uh, just <laughs> over two seasons ago uh, to, to where we are now with everybody in the midfield essentially being under 24. It's uh, it's a wild time uh, to be alive. I mean, obviously, this is a name in Lavia that's been connected with Chelsea since Joe Shields came to the club. Uh, formerly of Man City, then of Southampton, then of Gardening Leave, then of Chelsea. Uh, this is a player in which he clearly feels 
uh, is going to be a superstar. Otherwise, he wouldn't have pushed as hard as he could for two different places to take Lavia, right? At Southampton and Chelsea. Um, it's an interesting one. I think the main uh, questions that people have had are about squad construction. Like, where does he fit in? Will he get enough playing time? You know, how does the team look? What sort of formation are we going to play? All that sort of stuff. Uh, in due course, and I myself have, have held those concerns. There's no doubt about that. I've put out charts and such um, because I'm a big stats guy, as everyone knows. And I, I think that's it. But, I mean, again, exciting young player, clearly a talent. He wouldn't be a 60 million pound talent if he wasn't e- extremely promising, right? Played for a really bad Southampton team last year. Um, except for when they played us, and then they were uh, just fine. <laughs> um, and I saw him score against us uh, whilst I was down in Southampton. So that is my direct connection with Mr. Lavia. And uh, look, I really uh, hope that uh, the uh, the sporting director um, makeup got this one right. I mean, it's a lot of money for a 19-year-old, right? One of my favorite graphics I saw came from at stuff sab says who i believe will be trying to get on the podcast here in the very near future but it Breaking was news <laughs> it was 35 different midfielders in the premier league from last season stats and it was looking at on the x-axis it was successful passes post recovery per 90 and it was enzo caicedo and lavia are basically all in the same little quadrant of being in the near sixes range and having the ball retention percentage post recovery of around 85%. So effectively the thought is that when we win back the ball, we just, a, we might not give it away. And if we do give it away, we're going to end up recovering it uh, pretty regularly with this type of compliment of Enzo Caicedo and Lavia I do think it creates a lot of interesting questions that I want to get into. But before that, Nick, we do like to take a little bit of a tour down Liverpool Lane (laughs) to talk about what happens when you mess with Chelsea and try to get a deal done. And maybe when you deprioritize a player, how that might go against your desire to actually have them join your team. I just love this first one that you pulled uh, from uh, Southampton director Jason Wilcox, who said, we had an offer on the table, which we accepted from Liverpool, comma, but then Chelsea came to the table, uh, i.e., you know, everyone's a gangster till a real gangster enters the room. That's that's basically what that means to me is. Uh, you know, Liverpool going through their own ownership struggles and based on the way their fans reacted to when Chelsea went through sanctions, wish them nothing but the best, you know? Um, So tremendous stuff from them. Uh, But, you know, it's just, it, it is a fascinating thing, Dan, that despite everything that has happened over the last 16 months to Chelsea, sanctions, new owners, terrible season, on and on and on that the pull, the pull to Stamford Bridge, the pull to Chelsea is so strong, right? That you would, if you're Romeo Lavia or Moises Caicedo, say, I don't need to play in Europa League this year. I'm good. You know what I want to play? And I want to play in the freaking Premier League for Chelsea. I want to help Chelsea win, right? And it's fascinating, you know, and I think uh, this was on TalkSport earlier today. I think Jim White brought this up. Uh, and, it, and it didn't even cross my mind until he said it. But he was like, all of these kids, and they are kids. I say kids as an actual, these are these are tiny humans. Um, they all grew up watching young, Chelsea Young men, stuff. young adults. They, they are all above the age of 18. So let's just put that in context. Grown men, but but kids. And they all grew up watching Chelsea win stuff. They didn't w- grow up watching Liverpool win stuff. They wanted to be Didier Drogba. They wanted to be Frank Lampard. They wanted to be Petr Cech. They wanted to be John Terry. And, you know, the fact that, like, success begets success to me, I think we're we're seeing the legacy of the, some of that stuff with this younger generation who played FIFA and all that sort of stuff with John Terry and all these guys. Like, it it may be that we just have the pull, that we just have the, the riz, if you will, in, in the room. Wow. We really are dating this podcast quite 
quite dearly by Riz. adding in some Riz. <laughs> Look, but apparently we did have that level of pull because Sacha uh, Tavaliri put out some information after some of the first tweets came out regarding Lavia saying yes to Chelsea and that the deal is effectively agreed that basically Lavia felt as if Liverpool played with him. He was there waiting for them and felt like they didn't consider him a priority. A sign of this was that they were waiting for him on negotiating. He understood that Liverpool was already seeking for other options. On the other side, Chelsea had always kept the same line with the same speech to the player and a faithful and upright will. As written yesterday, Liverpool lost too much time last week with low ball offers or low offers before the Blues assault. That's one of the reasons why he will be a Chelsea player next season, even if his initial preseason preference was the Reds. And I think you have to give credit to Joe Shields in this one in terms of the way that you would imagine he's stayed in contact, that he's developed a relationship, that that relationship has matured appropriately. And with him being a part of our recruiting staff and with part of our infrastructure that we have in place, that I'm sure that proved critical because there wasn't the same individual on Liverpool side as well, pushing internally to get the deal done, to prioritize the player nor externally with the likely relationship and the way that the conversation went between Lavia and his camp and Chelsea. Yeah, I mean, again, like Shields has pushed for this twice, right? So there has to be some real belief there. I think there is some statistical analysis that would prove out, you know, and, and, and basically extrapolate where he is now in a couple of years. And it's it's pretty exciting stuff, right? It's not where he is right now, though. And I think that is something that we all have to, you know, I've, I've said this in the season preview and I'll keep saying it. These are all, we're a U23 team right now, right? And with a U23 team, there will be exciting, amazing moments. And I think some phenomenal attitudes already being shown around, you know, Chelsea. And there will be moments where they don't know what they don't know, <laughs> you know? cup competitions, like how to win, all that sort of stuff. And so I just, I caution everybody to start grading these guys on the same curve in which you would have graded uh, Aubameyang last year, Lukaku, or any of these other seasoned professionals. Kid is 19 years old. Ugu Chuku is 19 years old, right? They could be phenomenal midfielders in the future. Hell, they could push out Enzo. Who knows how good they're going to be, right? But I'm just giving you an example. Don't there's one of your YouTube clips with with, with Dan's dumb face making a making a whoa what did you say? You uh, sure about that? Are you sure about that? <laughs> uh, but just all all I'm all I'm trying to say is like there there will need to be some time built into this player right and and frankly any player under 25 there's just going to need to be time before they are who we think they really can be. And so yeah. my hope is for Chelsea fans is, yes, all of this is very exciting. Transfers in, very exciting. Transfers out, some of them, very exciting. Just walk into this season with, with the right level of expectation and remember who you were when you were 19 years old. I don't think that anybody is their best version of who they're going to be at 19 years old. So, you know, just I'm throwing it out there and just trying to temper a little bit. That's all. Well, speaking of tempering, we did have a couple of questions asking us to maybe temper the enthusiasm for Lavia in the consideration of what his incoming arrival means for other players on Chelsea's current roster. Gabriel asking the question about what is Chelsea going to do with this logjam of young midfielders we have now? What do you think Chelsea's long-term plan is for the talent? So I think that's two separate questions. One, the logjam for mid young midfielders. There's going to be some loans and there's going to be some sales. I think that is just a a definite next step from where we are today yep. is that existing players will be sold or existing players will be loaned. And it doesn't take a whole lot of work to figure out who are the sellable players, unfortunately, based upon some thought, and who are the loanable players based upon how recently that they were acquired. So the long-term strategy, I would say, is to try to find the next Enzo or the next Caicedo on a 30 million pound, 40 million pound, 50 million pound purchase before they're a hundred million pound player and either have a dearth of options to go sell for record profits, 
profits because that is a part of Chelsea's business model, and I don't think it's going to go yep. away anytime soon. And then oh. the other part of that is to have those players progress into taking over another player's more senior role in the future, that they will probably be... Like, this is a a very thoughtful injection to try to get Chelsea back up to the level as quickly as possible through where we need to be to be competitive and go fight in your go fight for European spaces, go fight for top four and firmly be in there so that over the next one to two seasons, we are a legitimate title contender in the Premier League again, which requires a deep squad, which is what we're trying to establish and build. So I think those are the things that come to mind for me, Nick. And there's a follow-up question that Millhouse had, which I think ties to what is the impact or who's the impact effect specifically. And this was if, when Lavia signs, also mentioned Elise, who we'll talk about shortly, who do you want to see get loaned or sold? Because I think, again, we're just going to acknowledge that is going to happen as a byproduct of bringing in another midfielder on top of Caicedo. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been pretty clear for some time through reporting that Connor Gallagher is essentially, I think, the, the guy to to fall victim, right, um, to, to the influx of young talent. I personally think that is going to feel really awful when it happens um, because he has shown nothing but loyalty and effort and heart and enthusiasm to play at Chelsea. He's a boy, a Chelsea fan. He's been here since he was seven, I think. And that one's going to feel bad. Um, I'm not looking forward to that. In fact, I've expressed my opinion that I would rather just keep him and, and focus our funds elsewhere um, because I don't think you can buy that sort of academy spirit. Um, and so, you know, the, again, I there will be consequences for all these moves, right? We're not going to carry 38 players again like we did last year. Um, I think there is a real, you know, it's either Uko Chukwu or or Santos then that goes out too, right? Um, probably on loan, um, I would assume for, for both of those players, but, um, but still that's, that's potentially going to be, you know, two, you know, one or two players in the midfield that are out. I also think that, you know, Elise comes in, we'll talk about him in a second. Carnes, who just played a really decent game against Liverpool, probably like a seven out of 10 performance. And who was started, sure. I think all, all but one mid, uh, preseason game in midfield. Um, not going to be a whole lot of minutes for that guy either. And he's he's been a talent that's been on everyone's radar for a long time. So I think I think the risk in this approach, as a, as positive as Dan can spin uh, anything, is that you have a 19 year old Lavia potentially right behind a 21 year old Caicedo, right? You might have a three-month younger Mataweke behind a three-month older Elise. There, there is no, like at that moment, there is no like clear succession where one player is near the end of their career. The, the next guy comes through like some, some other clubs are, are very good at kind of stacking their players accordingly. Sure. Malagusto and Reese James are three years apart, right? You know, so Chilwell and Kukurea, one year apart, Matson three years apart from both of them, four years from Chilo, but you get the point. Like, Batty Shield and Colwell, basically the same fucking age, right? I mean, th this is this is the problem that I potentially see with this strategy. Is like, yes, it's a stockpile approach. Yes, do I think that Batty Shield in three years would have been eighty five million based on the way the transfer market goes? I do, and I think that we got a steal on him, and I think he's really good, but is let alone an academy pathway through is there a pathway for some of the the young guys that you just bought i don't know it really depends on how you manage the squad and how the squad kind of finally shapes up but i think your your point is correct that you know for a large majority of these guys unless you are the guy you're going to be a backup and you know i think the good spirit only lasts so long when you, when you're not playing so let's hope that they have a really, really, really good plan to make this come to life in a, in a sensible way. You have to hope that it 
models more after what Manchester City has done, where there are people who are really great players who are talented enough to start in other teams who are comfortable with the fact that they're in a winning organization and want to continue to play there and be a part of that. And that's the hopeful end strategy to all of this would be if we could get there once again and be a side where people are very happy with rotational minutes, with being a part of 20 appearances, potentially a season, but they win two to three trophies a year, that could be a pretty happy place to be a backup instead of being a starter and might extend your career. So I think there's a lot of considerations that we can put into place around what that could look like. It's also, you know, by this point, everyone's seen the Simon Jordan clip where he's talking about how Chelsea is within FFP. But one thing that he did say at the end, and and I think that it kind of went overlooked because it wasn't the like, slam piece um that everyone was was talking through if chelsea get back into the champions league there are no financial worries like you make so much money from the champions league and that competition and the tv rights that come from that that you know this squad of young relatively low wage i say relatively low wage players can be profitable for the club right that the new stadium coming along would be profitable for the club that they'll find other profit centers as well but right now, it just feels a little tenuous because not all that stuff has happened. But again, Chelsea makes it in the Champions League, you know, this year, which would be a huge achievement based on where we have been. Then everyone can shut the fuck up, <laughs> you know? It, like, that's it's a it divergent strategy. It's the zig when others are zagging. And that is not always understood in the moment. That, that's the other piece that I was going to say. There's this everyone talking about Chelsea exploiting loopholes. Chelsea are simply following the guidelines that have been in place for every other fucking team that plays in the Premier League. How is it a loophole when you can do when every other team could do this if they wanted to? They're just choosing not to. That's it. So it's not a loophole. Fucking miss me with the loophole thing. Drove me nuts this week. I couldn't believe what I was seeing from seasoned journalists who clearly don't know what the rules of the league are. It's crazy. Sorry, rant over, but holy shit. You don't know the rules? Read the rules. You don't like the rules and the way that they're being used or abused? Change the rules. That's that's what the work is to be done. that's what they're going to do. (laughs) They will. That's what they're going to do. And then we'll find the next loophole that we can exploit. Look, we're going to take a real quick ad break before we talk about other ways that Chelsea are apparently gaming the system when it comes to Elise joining Chelsea. But stay tuned, and we'll get into that right after the break. All right, so on tap, the next signing that Chelsea are looking to go after, Elise from Crystal Palace. We got a couple of tweets this afternoon, Nick, U.S. time. One from Fabricio indicating that Chelsea have activated the 35 million pound release clause in Elise's contract and the deal is advancing to the final stages. He also indicated the clause has always been there despite denials and that all parties will be in touch to finalize the agreement. And then Elise has said yes to Chelsea. Time to fix details. Ornstein reported it as Chelsea believed activated the clause. And then Nazar Kinsella indicating uh, after both of them further confirmation that the release, uh, the release cause had been triggered and that Chelsea's business continues at a rapid pace. And I think the thing we would want to tie off on, I just want to talk about excitement first. I'm super excited. I think Elise is a phenomenal young talent. His passes into the box and his ability to set others up is going to be something very, very exciting, both from a dead ball situation And then also from in the act of play, those are things that are going to be very, very intriguing for him. I mean, he was at 0.38 assists per game last season. Again, in a Crystal Palace side with an attacking infrastructure about as bad as ours and worse, like on paper, you would have argued that they should not have scored more goals than us because of who their striking and attacking options were. Yet they scored one more goal than Chelsea did all of last season. Olise was absolutely their most creative player. And what we've been talking about this summer is that Chelsea needs more of that creativity, more of that excitement. And Olise fits the package. The biggest question mark really is going to be how quickly does he recover off of the hamstring tear that he had, which he picked up on U21 duty for France. So it seems like that is something that's probably a September, maybe October timeframe for full recovery. 
So that does dampen the excitement just a little bit, but the enthusiasm I think still has to be extremely high from thinking about how we watched him last season and what he was able to do in a really, really turgid Crystal Palace team. Yeah, I mean, it's very clear of the type of talent that he is. Um, you know, I think we've all seen some of the assists that he put through last year. The highlight reels are sexy. He's a great dribbler, quick as all hell. And, you know, that left foot is is dynamic. There's no, there's no other way to put it. Um, it's an interesting move, right? I mean, it's a cost-effective move. Another 21-year-old on a relatively low um, buyout clause um, that is on relatively low wages that we'll be able to give a nice boost to that won't break our wage structure, right? So that makes sense. Um, it's also a very interesting note as we were kind of talking in the in the group chat today that, you know, I think a lot of uh, our smarter group chat members, of which I don't uh, put myself up there, I think that he will play number 10 um, in this system without um, necessarily, you know, having Nkunku until I think probably February myself personally, but maybe I'll be wrong there. So it'd be interesting if he does come back to kind of see where he's slotted in. He's typically played on the right wing for Palace, but has, you know, the the passing range and ability um, to play that number 10 role. If we do play in that 4-2-3-1, which is... uh, you know, in in one real game so far, we have not not featured that uh, as a role. Um, but you know, it, the the thought of him making passes into Jackson, making passes across to Mudrick, Mudrick making passes across to him, the dribbling in the box—he's not as tricky as Matawake is. Let, let's just be very clear about that. Um, and and thus, I think that that's going to be a real battle between those two. Um, that's going to be. Uh, a lot, a lot to do. Um, but it's a very talented player. Um, you know, I think we've had many conversations, Dan, about, you know, do you go for the goal scorer in Kudus or do you go for the assist maker in uh, in Elise? And it's it's clear that the club has have made their choice on that. And I think it's just a, it's a very, it's a sensible move. I think the question, again, is squad construction and who gets minutes where. Yeah, the thing with Kudus, I think, is that this feels like taking advantage of a market opportunity where Olise, without a release clause, is not going for 35 million pounds. That just isn't happening. So Can you're we getting... call him Relise? <laughs> God, please no. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of Relise, there was a little twist reported. Uh, Sammy uh, Mokel- Mo- Mockbell was reporting from the Daily Mail that the move was accused of tapping up on behalf of Crystal Palace, informally alleging grievances that they've communicated them to Chelsea, Chelsea being comfortable that they've acted within the rules and the appropriate etiquette. The summary of the article indicating sources from the South London Club have considered formally reporting their top flight rivals for making an illegal approach though whether they are prepared to take such a drastic step remains to be seen. In the event of the formal action from Palace, Male Sport understands that Chelsea are comfortable with the way they have conducted themselves in the pursuit of Olise. It's widely accepted in the football community that discussions between clubs and players often take place before the buying team registers a formal approach for the football they are trying to purchase. But in this instance, there's a sense at Palace that Chelsea have overstepped the mark. Palace have worked hard to convince the forward to ignore Chelsea's attempts. And there's optimism that Elise, who is currently recovering from a long-term hamstring injury, would stay committed, at least in the short term. You know what this Dan's sounds like, Nick? Narrating audiobooks here pretty soon. He's he's really working on his narration voice. It's good. It's nice. This smells of, and I think a friend of the pod, Ali Glanville, put this out on Twitter, that Crystal Palace has a clause in the contract that they didn't want people to use or action. This is the conspiracy theory. There's no general reporting on this yet, but this would be my assumption based upon looking at why they would be frustrated. Why would you be frustrated and be crying foul when 
there is this wide acceptance in footballing and footballing communities that players and agents talk before official action is taken. A, you need to make sure the player wants to come. Like, why bother activating the release clause if the player doesn't want to come? You might want to check and yep. say, hey, how's the hamstring? Because if you're out until January, we'll see you in January. We don't want to bother talking to you right now. But if you can come help us in September or maybe the beginning of October and there's another October three months of the season, you could be available. It's very exciting, very intriguing. And there were multiple conflicting reports in the early days of the Elise saga that there was confusion around whether or not the release clause was still in effect. Jacob Steinberg and others had reported there was no release clause or was no release clause hammered home the concept that there was not one. And now today we get three or four confirmations that absolutely there was a release clause. So it sounds like hidden in paragraph A, subsection B, part one, anecdote E, that there was a consideration for something like a release clause that nobody was supposed to find out about. And doggone it, Chelsea did. And now Crystal Palace is upset with that fact. That's how I read it, but I could be wrong. Well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of my own actions, that's how I read it. Um, yeah, and it's it's also, you know, I remember it, there there was like a off season in the NBA. I think it was 2010. It was, it was right before LeBron went to South Beach um, where it was all the players were talking about where they were going to go amongst themselves and the NBA owners were crying foul because it was tapping up, right? That the players were talking to each other. Like, you can't stop that. You can't stop players talking to each other about the, the money they make or the or the contract they have or, or if they want to play together. Like, all these dudes talk. That's what they do. And you would have to assume that the football fraternity is about the same uh, way, whether it's the same exact way or not, you know, TBD. But... If you don't think that Elise knows people at Chelsea after having uh, been an academy player at Chelsea, you're out of shocked. your mind. And, and I, for one, am shocked personally, Dan. I think it's a great call, but it's just it's just another it's just another silly story. I think people in the media are looking for any sort of like, where's Chelsea going to lose one of these transfers, right? Uh, and you can't that's, keep that's getting away with on. it. <laughs> yeah, basically, I think that's all that's happening here. So uh, who knows what happens with the knock on effects? I know we're going to talk about that next. But, you know, being an exciting player, he's had injury issues. So we have to be honest about that, that he may not be the world's most durable player. He's slight of, of frame, uh, gets tackled a lot, as tricky wingers typically do. I think we all remember the uh, beating that Eden Hazard took in the Premier League. Uh, and he's not as stout as in Hazard. So there's going to be work to do with this young player. Again, a young player, patience and all that. But exciting talent. Everyone seems to be really thrilled. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be excited about. And hopefully we'll get a little bit of a Sam CFC Central podcast coming out in the very near future once something is completely official but everything seems to be pointing in that direction. In terms of knock-on effects, the consequences of my own actions being brought up against me, Fabrizio Romano also tweeted today that Newcastle were keen on signing Lewis Hall from Chelsea as a new fullback. Lewis Hall, who just recently signed an extension with Chelsea in preparation to go out on loan because the Crystal Palace deal is now in standby. So maybe... Chelsea not happy with the accusations that Crystal Palace has? I don't know. That could be. Why would you stall it? Why would you stall it, though? We do have a fullback we can offer you, Crystal Palace. It's just not Lewis Hall. <laughs> and so, you know, there's We cannot there's replace that. him. Um, we cannot replace him. <laughs> oh, man. That's mean. But still uh, funny and, uh, and worthwhile of, of saying. But, yeah, I mean, look, this... This will all be swept, swept under the rug. Chelsea and Palace have done great business together over the years. I think we've talked about the loans that they had for Ruben Loftus-Cheek and Connor Gallagher and, and the like. If I'm sure if Crystal Palace came to the table with 45 million pounds, they could have Connor Gallagher again. That seems to be the way it's trending. So they, they will be fine. They're, this is nothing to do about nothing. 
It's winning the narrative war that teams are concerned with right now. Nobody wants to be seen as a pushover in this market. Now, here's the interesting thing, Nick. You put in a little bit of a lineup, an 11 here, with the player depth that we're starting to develop in all these positions. And this is considering the fact that you know, if Elise comes in, when Lavia comes in, that this is the lineup. So I'll go ahead. I can I can do the reading if you'd like in my typical fashion where you have Sanchez and Bettinelli right now as the backup goalkeeper between the sticks. You've got Go a, on, Bets. Come on. You got a back four of Reese James, followed up by Gusto, Malagusto, Tiago Silva, and Di Sassi, Colwell and Batia Shiel, and then Chilwell and Kukurea. You have a midfield obviously M- missing Fafana in the in the back line there in the depth chart, but he sure. long term injury, so just note that. Yeah, and then in the midfield you have Caicedo and Gallagher, Enzo and Chakwameka, Lavia and Santos, and then from an attacking three you have Mudrik and Sterling on the left. You have Elise and Matuidi on the right, and then you have Nico Jackson and Armando Broya up top. So talk me through what you're thinking, why you dropped this in the script. You know, again, I read it in advance, unlike some people do. And uh, I mm. was aware that this was coming up. So, uh, but I think I know what you're getting at. Yeah, this is a, uh, it's just a look at what the squad construction can look like. Cause I think that is my main thing that I'm trying to figure out how this team functions, who gets minutes, all that sort of stuff. I think the the two that are missing pretty significantly here, or actually three that are missing, uh, Fafana, obviously huge record signing last year, hurt consistently, unfortunately won't play that much this year, if at all. Chris Kunku in that number 10 spot, uh, is not listed here due to his injury until January, but he will be back at some point this year. Just everyone knock on wood, send good vibes, do what you do. And then Ian Monson is not listed here, right? Uh, player that, uh, was one of the subs that came on, uh, for uh who did he come on for on sunday um sterling i think sure let's go with that playing yeah right wing so those three aren't even listed here the squad has many other players like lukaku and ziesh and a whole bunch of players that will go out on loan including lewis hall it looks like but or sold whatever is going to happen there it's deep right now you know, fast forward a year, it could be that Tiago Silva retires and that kind of takes one place out of the center back role. Sure. And then you have four center backs that are all under the age of 24 right there. James and Gusto seems to be a match made in heaven on the right hand side. Chilwell and left back to be named later, hopefully in Matson, uh there. Lavia, Santos, Enzo, Caicedo in the middle. I would put Gallagher and Chukwameka as the number 10s until Nkunku gets back. Again, not a hell of a lot of minutes for either one of those players, though, right? Elise and Matueke. We know that Matueke can actually flex as a striker, uh, whereas Elise is definitely not a striker. Mudrik and Sterling, right? Uh, fascinating to see what happens to Sterling if he doesn't start, if he doesn't get minutes. I actually thought he was okay on Sunday. Not a great performance, but okay. And then Jackson and Broya. You know, we saw lots of training photos of Broya today and he looked, he looked good in those photos and, and perhaps is getting back to full fitness. And we know there's a beast there. If, if he gets healthy, it's a fascinating squad, right? We obviously are missing a goalkeeper right now, or maybe missing a forward, but and then there will be loans, but it's a really fascinating squad to look at. Very flexible positionally and young, energetic, youthful, almost a full squad turnover in a year and a half. That's yeah, all, I'm, that's all I want to say. I'm looking forward to our end of the window grading. And I think it's going to be a very high grade. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, if, if the outgoings that we need to finish off on get done, there, there's going to it's this is a pretty historic window in the Premier League without Champions League football that has been pulled off by this team. And while we can have qualms about the way some deals went or how long they took or how much extra we paid, I don't think you can question 
that this ownership group has ambition. You're not signing off on multiple 100 million pound players in a very short window if you don't want to get this team to the top of the mountain. To win. Yeah. Right? And, and I think we also see, you know, for as dominant as City were last year, they, and they have some young talent coming through. They're not getting any younger. Liverpool are aging out, right? Even though they're trying to not age out, but we keep stifling them, God damn it. Arsenal are, are young, relatively young. I think they're more clear, closer to where we are. Newcastle are kind of middle of the road. You start to look around, and it's not hard to project with the right management and squad management and player development where this team could go in three or four years. Again, I caution you though, that's not going to happen this year, right? So if, if we are able to get back into Europe, recoup some of the revenue, get the shirt sponsorships, you know, sorted out, get some of the remaining dead weight off the books, like the wage bill alone, this is something that people aren't talking enough about. The wage bill has been completely turned upside down. Reset. I think Raheem they Sterling. Reset. Yeah. Raheem Sterling is like the last high earner, like high, high earner on, on the books. That And that's a, it. Like it, these guys are all, they went from our top earners making 350 million or 350 million, 350,000 a week to 150 a week, 200 a week. That's a huge deal over the course of a season and or eight seasons as we're now signing players. And of course, there's renegotiations that can happen there. But it's, it's the one part of the financial thing that like Naz paid attention to really closely last summer that I'm really interested if people will report on at the end of this window when looking at Chelsea's wage structure from three years ago and looking at it now. Well, I just to point on that real quickly, because I think this owes we owe it a full analysis as we get closer yeah. to the end of the window. But you look at Raheem Sterling and Lukaku are both, according to Capology, at the 325 million pounds a week, which ends up being 16.9 million pounds a year. The difference is someone like Reese James and Ben Chilwell, Reese James at 250,000 pounds a week, Ben Chilwell at 200,000 pounds a week. The difference, though, of 250 to 325 at that 75,000 pounds a week is an additional 3.9 million pounds. So if you're saying we've taken off one player, two player, three players that are making that astronomical level, you're clearing six million off the books with two players in terms of your wage bill. So there's been a lot of work done here. Chelsea have had one of the highest wage bills in the Premier League every single season for as long as I can remember. So this is a massive reset. The real quick question before we go an ad break, Nick, from Blue London 1905. In light of all the signings, does this significantly recalibrate your expectations and is top four now the minimum for this side? No, doesn't. Squad's too young. First year manager. I think this time next year, uh, assuming that the season goes relatively well, which I think, you know, again, we kind of gave our preseason predictions already. And, you know, I'm still worried about replacing Nkunku's goals, um, frankly. Uh yep. I think this time next year, this team could be absolute sauce. I mean, it could be, it could be scary. It could be really fun. Uh, I think we're at regular fun right now. I, I think next year could accelerate to really fun. Maximum fun at Stanford Bridge. It's going to be coming soon. But we're going to take a last ad break and get into all the remaining news regarding a new player from Santos coming to Chelsea, but maybe going on loan. What's going on with Ziesh and a backup keeper? So stay tuned. We'll be right back. All right, Nick. So we're going to be doing a podcast recording tomorrow night to talk about this player. But DVD, uh, David e. Washington, fr the Presidente from Santos, is coming to Chelsea and then <laughs> heading to Strasbourg. Um, Fabrizio Romano, here we go, confirmed. A official statement soon as the deal was officially signed. A 16 million euros plus 4 million deal. And it seemed also to be at the same time that Wahi... The interest cooled off completely. He's going to West Ham now this season. It feels like this is just, again, it's one for the future. He's not going to be helping the first team squad this season. But a lot of excitement from people in Brazil, for people who know Santos as a team and who have watched the player. A lot of general excitement for what he could bring in the future if his developmental curve continues. 
Yeah, I mean, again, I won't pretend to have watched a ton of Santos last year. Yet. Um <laughs> Unlike some, <laughs> some Twitter, uh, some Twitter IKTs out there that will uh, that will tell you otherwise. But um, I, you know, again, why buy a hundred million pound striker when you can buy them for sixteen plus four and develop them into a hundred million pound striker? I, that is why this is happening. That's why Nick Jackson was bought at 35 million pounds. That's why my hope is that Armando Broya gets a real chance in the team this year. Because in addition to paying for your Caicedos and your Lavias and, and the other high price targets that, that we've talked about, we have, we're going to have this multi-club model now where we can yep. send people to Strasbourg and to, you know, a Portuguese club to be named later and to a Belgian club to be named later. And that is the whole point that you're able to identify talent early. Um, different countries, as we learned with the Strasbourg deal, have different rules and regulations as it pertains to, um, you know, which visas a player needs to, to play in a certain league. You know, it's a bit, it is a concern. We never thought we'd get into visa law here on the one in this blue podcast, but here we are. Um, and, and look I, again, there's a ton of hype. Anytime someone is signed from Brazil, it's a great footballing nation, right? They've produced some immaculate towns. Neymar famously from Santos. Um, there's a lot of buzz around this kid. There are a lot of Santos fans who are really disappointed he's not staying this year, um, which could be hype. It could be true. We'll have to wait and see. But, you know, if he does go to Strasbourg and Vieira's there, and I think, you know, most most of us are, like, happy that Vieira's, you know, going to be developing the likes of Angelo and then maybe this Washington character, stuff like that, then we're going to be in a pretty good spot. We'll get a chance to watch plenty of highlight reels from the Presidente during his time in League Un, and hopefully watching Strasbourg continue at the start of a really strong campaign that they would like to keep pressing forward on this season and not be near the relegation zone like they finished at the end of last season. No news on Kudus. I just put it in there because I know you're a Kudus stan. You love more news about him related to Chelsea, but there's nothing new since last time we talked about it. But there is, however, Nick... Multiple people talking about the fact that ZS to PSG is back on. So get the docu sign ready. We're even, so back. Even friend of the pod, Mr. George Smiley, 1905, saying that ZS to PSG should be wrapped soon. Look, be great for him. Be phenomenal for him to go get to play. He shouldn't be stuck just hanging around the training ground. It's unfortunate that the Saudi deals fell off because of medical reasons or concerns. PSG wants him. Let PSG have them, get the wage off the books, continue rebuilding this phenomenal side that you've put together, and you just wish them well for being a contributor over the past couple of seasons. Indeed. Um, hasn't made a stink this summer. Hasn't been in the, in the papers requesting a transfer, all this sort of stuff. I think there was probably a, a pretty good understanding post-January of what was going to happen with the player. Yeah, My hope is that the club... It gets this across the line. Um, and, and yeah, then, then that is another thing that we get to take off the books for, for the year. Right. So, uh, it's exciting. You know, it's like if Lukaku gets done, if some of these loans get done, you know, there's a little rumors that Juventus are going to come back in for Lukaku. Like, Incredible. Oh, be amazing. It'd be absolutely amazing. And I really want Spurs <laughs> to bid for Lukaku. Just, just for a little bit of fun, just a little bit of a wrinkle. They're missing a striker, Dan. I don't know if you heard about it over the weekend, but they're missing a striker. Yeah, a striker who went to the Bundesliga and then lost the first trophy that he was up for. Can't, <laughs> can take the man out of Spurs, but you can't take Spurs out of the man. As we get forward, though, there is a thought that Chelsea may be going and looking, do some shopping in MLS for our backup keeper, Petrovic, who plays for the New England Revolution, apparently is on a list of individuals that Chelsea are considering. Good friend no. of the pod, member of the, uh, you know, not necessarily a member of the Porto Five, but someone we hung out with in Porto would say True. that Chicago Dimitri was talking about he would be happy with it. But with the MLS transfer window being closed, New England can't bring in a replacement, so he doesn't see it happening. It sounds like it's something is more of a fantasy 
not necessarily the reality of who Chelsea will get in as a second choice option to now uh, compete with or try to play alongside Sanchez and take the number one spot. Yeah, I, I don't know what the hell is going on with the goalkeeper thing. Kepa announced, uh, wants to stay at Madrid, and I think we're all really thrilled about that. Like, just, you know, make that happen, please. Um, but, yeah, there's not been many discussions about the backup keeper. There were some, like, wild rumors the day that Kepa was, you know, thought to go to Madrid. And then it's been no follow-up to that. It's been very odd that Chelsea would get rid of their former number one a day before the first game of the season and that there has not been a backup signed yet. Um, obviously, no, a lot of effort is going into the lobby thing, the Caicedo thing, all that sort of stuff. But you got multiple sporting directors. Like, let's, we got to get to this To be fair, story. the multiple sporting directors are working a much better concert with one another than they did in the same window where Ziyech's deal couldn't get done because all the focus was on Enzo. So from a January to now, very much marked improvement. If there were a needs improvement on that window for not being able to get everything done that they wanted to do, they're getting a much higher grade this 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 summer. I will say the only other crazy one was some level of Portuguese reporting. Very limited was the Diogo Costa links as being a potential up upgrade option, true number one option, but he also would be ridiculously expensive somewhere in the 65 million pound range. And so the question is, can you keep on stacking all these payments? Who knows? But that could be one to watch if Chelsea want to go big and just absolutely annihilate the market and make everybody hate us. Yeah, it would, um, it would probably make sense to go find a like one year option type player to be your backup if if you really trust Sanchez, which is like hey, claim the cross up in the air. Yeah, I mean he did basic goalkeeping things. It was a fascinating study. Um, but if that is the case, then just go find a one year backup option out there. Uh, but and then go back in the market next summer. But it's. Yeah, it's a little worrying, to be honest. Well, we shall see. And the last bit of good news to end this episode on, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a thing we have to do now. We just kind of end with a little bit of positive news. Armando Broya pictured back in full practice with the team. You talked about it earlier in the podcast, Nick. You wanted to see Broya get an opportunity. He's there. He's got the bib on. He's training with the team. Could be very, very soon that we get an opportunity to see him in a live game. I don't know necessarily if it's going to be this week, but hopefully in the next one to three game weeks, we get a chance to see him back would be phenomenal. Yeah, it'd be absolutely great. I mean, this is one that I think we've been waiting to come come good on. And and he is a player with immense talent, great frame. Um, and we'll just kind of see how Poch kind of develops him in the system where he kind of plays, obviously Nick Jackson is the certified number one right now as a striker. Uh, but you know, care about cups coming up, you know, could he, could he see some cup matches and rebuild his fitness? And, you know, when, you know, Nico has a couple of off games, could he step in and, and potentially play a huge role for Chelsea this season? You need more than one striker to get through a, a season. So, um, yeah. Yeah, give, give me more nines and less false nines. That's all I'm saying. But that's going to do it, Nick. That's going to wrap it up because we have a bunch more podcasts coming at you this way, this your way this week. Again, we're, we're running on a little bit of fumes here at the moment, so it is time to about end this particular episode. But uh, are you a little? Are you happier now? You're happier. I feel like you're happier. I am very excited for the window to be over, Dan. Thanks for asking. <laughs> I'm very excited. <laughs> well, look, we hope you're excited as well. Keep enjoying the podcast. Share them with friends. Connect with us on all of our various social media platforms at London Blue Pod. Join our Patreon 
patreon.com forward slash London Blue Pod to get involved in our Discord community. Sign up for the newsletter, London is Blue dot Beehive, B E E H I I V. Don't ask me why they spelled it that way, dot com. And get Sam's wonderful missives on Wednesday mornings in your inbox. And stay tuned because we've got an episode with Naz coming up. We've got our episode on Washington coming up. We've got more player analysis pods with Sam coming out and just our general match review and other podcasts coming out. And we just want to say thank you so much for supporting the show. Uh, we appreciate the recognition. Some people said some very nice things about all the effort that we've been putting into it. And look, uh, we're not going to stop. As long as Chelsea's going, we're going. And uh, until next time, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.